Hey everyone, it's time for Good Week Israel where we'll give you ILTV's latest positive highlights. Get ready to smile because coming up, a pair of NFL football players have just been given a crash course in what it means to be an IDF soldier. Feeling hungry? We'll reveal just where to get a taste of the most typical dessert in the Holy Land, and we'll get an inside look at one of the most secretive ethnic minorities in Israel, the Druze. In an incredible partnership program, a pair of NFL football players have just been given a crash course in what it means to be an IDF soldier. And while these two athletes are at the top of their game, it turns out there's always some more to learn. Washington Redskins running back Adrian Peterson and cornerback Josh Norman, who just reportedly signed with the Buffalo Bills, are now returning from Israel after a very unique experience. The pair, who played together for two years, first arrived in Israel as participants in the International First Robotics Competition and in partnership with RoboActive 2069, an Israeli high school organization. But after the competition, they also participated in training exercises with the IDF, running obstacle courses with soldiers, taking lessons in Kav Maga, and even receiving military briefs on the threats against Israel. So how was it? Well, Norman says that it's amazing to get in there and train with the IDF because they're at the top of their game of being in combat, and Peterson is amazed by the soldiers' mental toughness and focus. As for the exercise that stood out the most, the players say running up a hill with 40-pound vests, which apparently feels like running in sand, tops the list. Now finally, while this was Peterson's first visit, Norman is no stranger to the Holy Land. He's visited three or four times already, wears a chai or life necklace, and is even considering moving here. And of course, both he and Peterson say they'd return to continue their philanthropy too. A very unique young band of sisters is making headlines for the way they're publicizing their newest album. And it turns out they're Israeli. Check this out. The Haim Sisters. If you haven't heard of them, it might be time to get online and do some catching up. Esti, Danielle, and Alana Haim have been gaining fame and popularity with their take on pop rock since their debut album, Days Are Gone, back in 2013. And it turns out their father was actually an Israeli professional soccer player who moved to the States to play for an American team. He then met their mother, and as they say, the rest is history. The girls got an early start in music, playing in a family band with their parents called Rockin' Haim. And I guess they had a knack for it because the group's first show was at a popular Jewish deli in Los Angeles, being paid in what else but matzah ball soup. And so now, with their newest album coming out in April, it only made sense for them to get back to their roots. The sisters announced on their Instagram that they will be playing live shows in Jewish delis in New York, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Denver, and of course, Los Angeles, saying, we've never done anything like this before, so let's all get together, eat some matzo ball soup, and we'll play you some songs live. I don't know about you, but I'm definitely craving a pastrami on rye. Now, for mothers unable to conceive, IVF, or in vitro fertilization, has been a miracle. And right here in Israel, a country that absolutely adores babies, the demand for IVF is on the rise. Further, according to a two-year-long study by the National In Vitro Fertilization Database, it's women over 40 who are seeking the treatment the most. ILTV's Natasha Kirchuk has the story. 10 to 15 percent of women around the world face problems getting pregnant. But for these women fighting to have a baby, there is a saving grace. It's called in vitro fertilization, or IVF. The only problem is that it could cost you tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. Except for in one country in the world where IVF is totally free. That country is Israel. I was 31 and I discovered that I had ovarian failure. I was told that the, my only chance for biological pregnancy was IVF. IVF basically allows doctors to harvest the eggs that a woman has left, screen them for genetic problems, and then implant them if they're healthy. And that was when I decided to extend my time here in Israel in order to, to pursue care here. IVF has been free in Israel from the very beginning. Infertility is a disease, and as a disease, it should be treated by the national insurance. It should be covered. The infertility treatment has been around since the 1970s, but Israel was one of the first nations to utilize it. It would have been complicated to pursue IVF in the States. I did an um, online calculator. A cost came out to something like $33,000 for one round. Quite frankly, my husband and I just graduated from grad school. 
we don't have $33,000 to do IVF. Today in Israel, any woman up to the age of 45 who requires IVF is able to receive the free treatment until she's able to conceive up to two kids. Every year, 4.8% of national births are through IVF. If you thought the biological clock wasn't a real concern, well, here's a quick anatomy lesson. A perfectly healthy woman in her early 20s has a 90% chance of conceiving in under a year. But by the age of 41, her chance of getting pregnant drops to 50%. The problem today is that many women are not aware enough of the problem of age if we talk about infertility. The majority of the women that pursue IVF are above 40, which may be why most nations don't consider infertility a disease. Some question whether or not Israel has made IVF free in order to enhance the Jewish population. But the treatment is free for every citizen, no matter what their religion is. It's not political. If I do have four kids, it's not because I think it's for the country, for the nation, it's for me. The families in Israel I want to have three, four kids. Family pressure to have children is very common, which is perhaps why it's still difficult for women to talk about fertility issues. But the acceptance of IVF as a treatment is helping change that. My mother suffered six miscarriages, and getting the right treatment was extremely difficult because of the lack of research and knowledge about fertility and women's health. This remains a weirdly taboo topic. One of the pieces that has allowed me to work through my own diagnosis is educating the people around me. 31, young, healthy. So the fact that it could happen to me really does mean that it can happen. But IVF treatments go beyond just helping women get pregnant. They also help prevent genetic disease. Jewish people have, on the average, more genetic diseases than other people in the world. IVF can be used to identify and implant healthy embryos so that couples who are worried about passing on a specific illness can be sure that their babies will be healthy. If people who are carriers of genetic diseases will go through IVF and will have healthy kids, then of course it's cost effective for the country because the, the national insurance will not have to grow very ill, very sick children. The fact that reproductive challenges are, are considered medical issues, it's transformed my life but I've also come to really see firsthand Israel has the best gynecological care of any country that I'm familiar with, and I have been doing a lot of research. Their maternal mortality rates here are some of the lowest in the world. Cesarean section rates here are the lowest in the OECD. It's normal here in Israel for there to be emergency rooms just for women, labor, and pregnancy. That's not the case in a lot of the world. That is not the case in the U.S. The reality is women's health in most of the world is undervalued, and that's the opposite here. In Israel alone, one in three women are sexually assaulted during their lifetime, and one in seven women are raped. An alarmingly high number of women don't speak out against their attacker. Now, one Israeli woman named Yudit Sidikman is attempting to change that through her nonprofit organization, El Halev, and ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh went to check it out. I was sexually assaulted by the cantor of my temple, and I didn't call it sexual assault until I was the mother of a 12-year-old, because I thought we had a romance. Like, we were together for six years from when I was 12. So he stole my childhood. One afternoon I went from 12 to 20, and I didn't have the tools to be a 20-year-old. No! Keep going. Don't touch me. No! The simple line is, we teach women to yell clearly, back off now, so that one day they'll be comfortable going, hey, guess what? I don't like the way this conversation is going. I'm leaving now. And if I really, really, two hands, you're really scared, no way. What? That wouldn't work. You could Wait, blow in somebody's face and have them like... Absolutely. Oh, what happened when, you, when I blew in your face? I moved away, yes. And you shut your eyes. Would I do this with that big scary... That's insane. But I would do it with a drunk friend at a party. Yeah. There are five principles or five fingers of self-defense. Think, yell, run, fight, tell. Empowerment self-defense covers all of those. And tell is no less important than fight or run um, or think. When you tell a story, um, of what happened to you, and the response is, well, why did you go there? Why didn't you leave when your friends left? The goal is to build communities who understand what it is to 
be supportive of the stories. If I'm scared, what's gonna happen next? I set a verbal boundary and they're now gonna get upset because I had the audacity to have feelings and, and wants and needs and state them. And they start now whacking on me or getting physical and I don't know what to do. I may not take that step. How do you not freeze like that? How do you have the nerve to do something like do that? You swim. so much bigger. Do you swim? Yeah. If I blindfolded you, spun you around 10 times and threw you in the water and you didn't know there was water there, would you drown? No. Why wouldn't you freeze? I just wouldn't in the water. No. <laughs> and our option for this, you know, on a different level is, no, no. That was so unexpected, wow. But that practicing of it's mine, what am I getting them to do? Kind of take control of themselves. Own their bodies. Right. My body, my right to decide what happens to it. Yeah, yeah, but right. I just want to say yeah, hi to you. It's so it's do okay, I. It's like... okay. Return to sender. Wow. Well, just <laughs> give the body part back. Yeah. Just keep giving the like, body no, part back. No, thank you. Thanks so much, right. but no. Okay. Yeah, give them their arms back. You wouldn't be able to push me. No. Push me. No. Push me. I don't want to push, push me. me. <laughs> I don't want to push, push me. I don't want to push okay. me. Okay. Now grab me. No. Oh, it seems easier that time. But that was interesting because the second you grabbed my arm, I was like, no. Like that felt more, almost like more comfortable. I felt like okay to say no that time. Because you practice it. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And yeah. And uh, don't forget to register for a course on your way. Oh yes, definitely. That's what I need. <laughs> you can tell I kind of need it a little bit. High up in the Carmel Mountains of northern Israel, you can find the Druze, a secretive ethno-religious group that plays a major part in Israeli society. The Druze people make up only 1.6% of Israel's population, but they serve in the army and the government. And ILTV's Natasha Kirchak had a chance to visit Dalit al Carmel, a place some would call the capital of the Druze community. Take a look. This is Daliet El Carmel, the center of one of the most secretive and special ethnic communities in all of Israel, the Druze. My name is Ahed and I'm Druze. My religion interprets many different religions, including Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, along with Persian Sufi, the Greek philosophy, and Buddhism. Today, my friend Ahed is going to reveal some secrets, what you can't miss out on in the Druze capital of Daliet El Carmel. Let's do this. The building that you see right behind me doesn't particularly stand out, but it's a Hilwe, the House of Prayer of the Druze. The thing is, most tours won't actually take you here to see it because you have to be a religious Druze to enter, which I clearly am not. The Hilwe is actually a place very far from everybody. As a minority, the Druze had to protect themselves and actually live in the mountains and have their uh, house of worship not visible to any other stranger that come here. That's why there are no arches, that's why there is no, no minaret, that's why there is no bells, nothing fancy. It's a regular, ordinary house, just like the other houses. The Druze don't permit conversion to their religion, which is why marrying outside of the religion is forbidden. But many Druze religious practices are even kept secret from the community as a whole. Only a group of elite initiates called the Knowers have access to the secret teachings of the scriptures. In order to become Druze, you have to be born to this faith. If you are uh, about to marry somebody from a different faith, you are outcasted. You are no longer refer as a Druze. Your kids are not gonna be born Druze. And get this, the Druze believe in reincarnation, which is why they value the soul more than the physical body. We believe that everybody that dies, his soul would enter to a newborn baby. This is the circle of life. Every family has a incarnated uh, a brother or sister. I have my own brother in his previous life. He was uh, married to a uh, woman and he died suddenly in the olive grove. And he remembered his incarnation when he was uh, four, uh, four years of age. My family and uh, his previous family uh, met, exchanged the details and uh, figure out uh, if he's telling the truth, but this is uh, not at to us. In the Druze religion, there are no set holy days, rituals, or ceremonies, because the Druze people are meant to be connected with God at all times. <laughs> the 
This is za'atar. It's basically Middle Eastern medicine. This is what Israelis like to call a pita dulzi. It's basically a thin bread called saj. They fill it with labaneh, which is a white cheese, cover it with za'atar spices, a little bit of spicy sauce if you want it, and of course, locally made olive oil. Pita drosi, every day, all the way. Ah, this is actually olive oil that's made out of olives collected in the surrounding area. So it's homemade olive oil. Another very strange thing that you might find is goat cheese labane in balls soaked in olive oil just hanging out outside. This will last for months as long as it's in room temperature. This is a gallery of Sam Chalabi, one of the most famous Druze artists in Israel. He's only 29 years old, but his work is already being displayed all over the world. I started at age 13. I worked in two galleries at the beginning. It was a family situation, of course, and financial. At age 18, I started here in this studio. אני אוהב לתאר את הסיטואציות okay. בהשקפת עולם מאוד חיובית. אימא שלי תמיד גרמה לי להסתכל על הדברים באופן שהוא חיובי, בגישה חיובית. זה מטורף, מה זה? עץ שורשי עמוק. אני התכוונתי שכולנו מאותו גזע. כל העמים, כל הצבעים, כולנו בני אדם, שזה הגזע. This is the one that I want to take home, but it's only 45,000 שקלס. מתנה. כן, אין בעיה. מתנה, מתנה. The poet Naftali Hertz Imber was working in this house as a Jewish advisor for Sir Lawrence Oliphant, a British Christian Zionist who would holiday in Daliat al Karmel. And it was here that Hertz Imber wrote the poem that would later become the basis for the Atikva. This house uh, became uh, in 1979 on the term of Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister. It became a memorial for the Druze soldiers that died on the line of uh, duty. And here's what's interesting. The Druze don't have aspirations for a state of their own. Wherever they are, they're loyal to the soil that they live on. So here in Israel, they're still required to go into the Israeli army. I hope you're hungry because we're talking Israeli dessert at its finest. Wondering what the most typical dessert in Israel is? Well, ILTV's Natasha Kirchuk will show you. The most typical dessert in Israel is to roll up a joint, I guess. Okay, we're taking this to different places, my friend. I know, Malabi, Malabi. Yeah, uh, let's go. Around 80 years ago, something magical happened. This arrived in Israel. It's called Malabi, a creamy milk pudding drizzled with a dash of rose water, some sweet syrup, and whatever toppings your little heart desires. This is a Malabia, one of the most popular joints in Tel Aviv to get your weekly dose, or for some daily dose, of Malabi. Would you like the vegan Malabi or the dairy Malabi? Try the vegan Malabi. The vegan, good yeah. choice. We have the classic syrup, we have vanilla cinnamon, lemon cardamom, and caramel. Look at what I get to eat. I actually bring my dates because it's cheap, you know, it's only 10 shakers. <laughs> I've never heard of Malabi before, but I feel like my world is open. Do you come to a Malabi a lot? Yeah, to uh, eat Malabi and to drink Arak. Mm -hmm. At 4.30 p.m., my friends. The treat has Persian roots that date back to the 10th century, but it made its way through Turkey and Syria before it landed in Israel. And for the last four and a half years, Malabia has been serving Malabi and Malabi only to hundreds of people on a daily basis. I'm sure that Malabia helped get the Malabi to be one of the most popular uh, desserts here in Israel. Everything is fresh, everything is made here, even the syrup itself. We're using organic rose water that are growing here in Israel. The lady who does the rose water for us, we help her to pick up the flowers. The procedure is very, very sophisticated. People did it like centuries ago. But Hamalabia is more than just Malabi. It's become a community center in Tel Aviv where customers can have drinks and play board games while they enjoy dessert. Sometimes a little too much. The Malabi is the most typical dessert in Israel. If I mix this with such a beautiful girl like you, this is all I need in my life. I, th this is everything for me, seriously. No, 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 don't leave Israel without trying uh, Malabi. If not our Malabi, someone else Malabi. Now, 
Israel is perhaps best known and deservedly so for its holy sites, but its standing as an incredible beach destination often goes unsung. While TV's Emmanuel Kadosh hit the beach to show you what Tel Aviv beaches are all about. The Tel Aviv Coastal Strip is around 14 kilometers long and stretches all the way from Herzliya to Bat Yam and is composed of 13 official beaches. At almost every beach you go to, you can find lockers to keep your personal items, dressing rooms for your convenience, kiosks where you can rent beach equipment. You can even rent beach chairs to lay and tan on just for 12 shekels and umbrellas for six. So for those of you who get antsy laying around tanning all day, there are a bunch of activities that you can do starting off with some beach volleyball courts and also surfboards and stand-up paddle boards that you can rent for an hour or the full day. The beaches are not ashtrays. We have to keep them clean. That's why they offer you ashtrays that you can actually stick right into the sand, put your cigarette inside, and not litter. All right, so let me give you some advice. The Israeli sun is super, super, super strong. So bring a hat, bring some sunscreen, get ready to sit under an umbrella, and relax. Most beaches in Tel Aviv are super kid-friendly, so you can even find playgrounds and some toys for the kids to hang out while you're tanning. Considering Tel Aviv has a pretty big nightlife scene, the parties don't stop at the beach. The city is filled with some of the coolest beach restaurants and bars to come hang out, grab a drink with good music and vibes. Let's go check out some of the best. And that's all for today's Good Week Israel. I hope we've helped you start your week off with a smile. I'm Nittany Manson. See you next week.